All right. Good afternoon, everyone. So we are off for our next panel discussion, um, which will be emphasizing pillar three uh, of empower all consumers to make and have access to healthy choices. Um, so I'm going to ask our panelists to um, please put on your cameras. And it's exciting that we have um, four individuals who are gonna share very important information of what they're doing in their communities. So the first thing that I'm gonna ask is that everyone um, who's on the panel, first, please introduce yourself and provide the name of your organization and a brief overview of what your organization's mission, vision, and or goals are. And let's start off with Marissa. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Marissa Spady. I am a registered dietitian and I'm the senior field manager for No Kid Hungry Tennessee and I'm located down in Chattanooga. Um, I work for No Kid Hungry. We are a uh, state campaign of a national nonprofit organization called Share Our Strength. And our goal at No Kid Hungry is to end childhood hunger by way of the federal child nutrition programs. Our hope is to have um, every child have access to three meals a day, 365 days a year. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's what we're here for. I work closely with the uh, school breakfast and school lunch programs, the CACFP at risk after school meals and the summer meals programs. All right, thank you. Who would like to go next? I can go next. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Hey, y'all. I'm Kamika Elliott. Um, I go by Mika. I am the founder of Rooted East Knoxville, um, which is a food and land justice collective here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, I'm also the founder of, of the Lotus Program Experience, which is a holistic meal service um, and wellness program for all women. However, we address disparities pertaining to Black women when it comes to um, maternal health mortality. Um, my goal is to create viable and innovative solutions to the common issues within the Black community, specifically East Knoxville. So I am not only a social worker, but I am a holistic food pathways practitioner, herbalist, community builder, and social issues disruptor. And my job is to educate um, our community on food apartheid, as this is what Rooted East addresses. Currently, Knoxville, um, the Black community pertaining to East Knoxville, lives 47% below the poverty line, making at or less than $20,000 um, annually. And so part of our vision is to recreate the food landscape in East Knoxville, as there's been a lot of Black removal or urban renewal, um, as most folks know it as, i.e. gentrification. Um, and so our goals are self-sufficiency, sustainability, and we also are wanting to create an abundant natural food landscape here in East Knoxville. Right, who would like to go next, Courtney or Marco? I'll go, can you hear me? Um, I'm Courtney Lyles. I'm the Nutrition Access Program Manager at Second Harvest Food Bank in East Tennessee. Um, we are a member of the Feeding America Network, um, and we work to, um, to feed East Tennesseans um, through feeding programs and um, over 630 agency partners. Uh, and actually, pretty cool thing, we just got our, um, our data from the, the previous fiscal year, or for 2023, 2022, 2023, and uh, we distributed 24 million pounds, which is a, um, a record for us um, across 18 counties in East Tennessee. So that's what, that's what we're doing. Thank you. And Marco? Yeah, hi everybody. My name's Marco Lemus. I'm the Food is Medicine Project Manager at Urban Till. We're based in Richmond, California. And our organization hires and trains local residents to cultivate agriculture, uh, feed our community, and restore relationships to land to build a more sustainable food system. We have a three-acre farm, a community gardens, school gardens. We distribute to the Farm to Table CSA. We have a watershed creek restoration, uh, you know, uh, 
program. And um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Well, thank you. So let, we're going to work our way backwards. We're going to start with Marco, then go to Courtney, then Mika, and then Marissa. So my next question for you is briefly describe the resources you work with or have in your position that help improve food access, which I think all of you did in a little bit in your introduction, but if you can expand some more on that. Yeah, so there's a bunch of different ways that we, uh, the resources that we use. Um, you know, our work wouldn't be possible without the volunteers that have came through and supported our programs throughout the years. Today is actually our 18 year anniversary too. So that's like crazy to think about. Um, and uh, a lot of our part, we create partnerships with a lot of different organizations. My, my job was created or my position was created to uh, you know, develop this collaboration we have with a clinic called Lifelong Clinic uh, here in Richmond. And I essentially uh, talk with the doctors and um, their resident doctors. Essentially, they spend a month at Urban Till uh, learning about our programs. And then at the end, they put on a certain project like a cooking demo for the staff or for the community. And um, so, yeah, and like our other partner orgs, uh, we have like a coalition made up of nine other orgs in Richmond that we, you know, have meeting regular meetings to talk about the different organizing around different issues and how to move forward with certain issues that come up. Um, yeah, and our local residents too are like our biggest resource, I think, because they're the ones that really guide our work. And we're always trying to get their input when it comes to future plans that we have and making sure that their voices are heard and included in um, the, blu the blueprints, essentially, for what we're creating for the in the near future. So, um, yeah, I'll keep it short like that. Um, so Second Harvest, um, we also rely um, on our volunteers um, and also uh, like donors and, and grants and things like that as far as like funding our food and getting food um, out to our community partners. But um, we really, we, we kind of are a resource in the community as far as like we partner and support other agencies that um, aim to distribute food. So um, we, as I said earlier, we have over 630 um, agency partners, and those include, you know, anything from faith-based organizations to um, even medical facilities. We have some um, some relationships with uh, the hospital, the UT Medical Center. Um, we're, we're currently with their uh, cystic fibrosis clinic and their heart failure clinic. We help provide um, medically relevant boxes, food boxes for the people who screen as um, uh, food insecure. Um, and then we also are partners with um, Food for Kids. We have a Food for Kid partner, or excuse me, program, which is kind of like a backpack program. If you guys have heard those, uh, heard of those programs before. So we're um, in all this, like 240 schools, maybe, across East Tennessee, where we're providing um, food over the weekend for these kids who may not have uh, access to food over the weekend. Um, so we're we're all over the place, really. And uh, But we couldn't do it without the these agency partners um, that are actually on the ground doing the work, um, knowing their community and what uh, what their people want and what they what they need. Okay. All right. So I just want to go back and reiterate our mission and vision. So the mission of Rooted East Knoxville, we are committed again to addressing food apartheid by restoring power back to the Black community through self-sufficiency, gardening, food education, and overall wellness. Um, our vision is to recreate the natural foodscape. Um, we are a movement um, that is community-led, community-funded. We are an autonomous organization with a 501c3 fiscal sponsor. 
Um, and we desire to create a thriving, resilient, and equitable Black community through collective partnerships, um, whether it be collective education, skills training, or holistic well-being. Um, and we do this by allocating community resources. We bring in allies, other abolition abolitionists. We currently are leveraging our existing partnerships. So our core team is made up of six um, grassroots organizers, which we are part of six different grassroots organi uh, organizations. And we have our own separate skill sets that we bring to the core team, but we also have individual networks that do intertwine with our mission and vision of Rooted East Knoxville Collective. So we have partners like United Way um, that have um, given us unrestricted funds to, you know, start the initiative. Um, we have Beardsley Farm that help us with gardening education and tools for our gardening core programming. Um, UT Ag Extension and the 4-H Extension, um, we bring those folks in to come and teach our gardening education. Um, other members of like the Community um, Growers Gardening Alliance, we get some of our volunteers from there. They are an alliance of master gardeners as well. So they will come in on the back end when it comes to um, teaching our community members how to be confident in growing their own food in their backyard or in local community gardens that we are establishing here in East Knoxville. Um, and then we also leverage our existing partnerships with attorneys. So as a social worker, I have leverage within the legal field as well. And so I leverage some of those partnerships as well as city council. Um, but our volunteers are absolutely awesome. And they do, um, you know, the biggest part, which is by showing up or connecting us and allowing us to be those community bridge builders to help bring and mobilize the resources that our community members are telling us that they need. Oh, and we also do this by providing this program and everything to the East Knoxville community for free. We do not charge for any of these resources that our community members need. Awesome. I think something you just mentioned was we're, we're bridge builders and I feel like um, my role at No Kid Hungry and helping to uh, address childhood food insecurity here in Tennessee um, has really been a bridge builder. Um, I work closely with the school nutrition directors across the state of Tennessee, as well as the community-based organizations who are sponsors of the Federal Child Nutrition Program. So uh, again, school breakfast and lunch at Department of Education and work closely with the state agencies as well as Department of Human Services. Um, and with that being said, understanding how things trickle down and understanding what's happening on the ground and being able to um, share out uh, best practices, not only here in Tennessee, but across the country, um, as we have a network of no kid hungry states across the country and learning exactly what uh, is happening. I, I just got in from a summer meal visit uh, from Cumberland County today and saw just an amazing, uh, the heart that goes into these meals for these communities is just amazing. And um, so our goal at No Kid Hungry is really to lift up those folks who are on the ground and getting meals out to families. Um, and uh, also advocacy. We have a team up in DC who are great advocates for the, these federal child nutrition programs. Um, so by finding out what's happening on the ground, we can relay these messages and stories back to um, our lawmakers and so that they can understand what can be most beneficial. Um, to families on the ground. Um, but ways that we typically work to be a resource to our school nutrition programs and our um, community-based organizations who are providing the meals to families, um, we often do grants for those organizations. Um, in fact, um, we just gave out about 17 grants to our summer meal sponsors who are going to be doing the rural non-congregate um, uh, meal distribution for summer meals this Summer. So that was very exciting just here in Tennessee. So I'm real excited for that. Um, we also do um, webinars um, to share best practices so that folks can learn. Um, you know, it's no need to reinvent the wheel here. We're all on the same team. We all want to end hunger together. So we provide those on a national basis and sometimes locally as well. Um, and then we do a lot of um, outreach uh, and awareness. I think some of the federal child nutrition programs, people are not aware of all the nuances and regulations that go into 
uh, families being able to participate in those um, and also the sponsors that are hoping to provide those meals. So we tried to do some education um, and outreach. Um, we have a text line during the summer months. So you can text the word food or Kamita to 304304 and figure out where the closest summer meal site is to you. So those are some of the ways that we try to be bridge builders within, um, within our states and in our communities across the country. Great, thank you. Marissa, would you mind when you have a chance to put that in the chat, the number? Because some of us are, are a little slow in taking numbers down. So if you could do that, that would be helpful for our audience. So as bridge builders, collaborators um, in the community, what are some things besides time, money, and people that other communities can do to start this process of improving access to healthy food options in their communities? Are we answering in order or is it just anybody? Whoever wants to jump in. <laughs> well, since I'm on here talking. <laughs> um, so as a food educator and pathways practitioner, I've noticed that it's very important to meet people where they are at in their health journey and their health goals. I think oftentimes people um, aren't relatable. Um, certain practitioners aren't relatable. Um, they're not of the community that they say that they desire to serve. Um, so it can cause a rift in community trust um, or um, acceptance when it comes to um, being receptive of the information. Um, and it's also not easy, easily digestible, at least for my community. So my job as a food educator is to not only meet people where they're at, but to also um, put it in layman's terms, how they can understand it. Um, and so also, I also think that it's important to um, look like those or at least send somebody into those communities that you say that you wanna work with that are of the community where people, you know, these community members either know a familiar face or they at least look like that demographic. Um, oftentimes in our marginalized community, um, we have other folks that, aren't of the community, they don't live in the community, our community, our community members aren't aware, so it causes this rift, and they don't want to communicate with them at all, no matter what the help or whatever it is, um, is, is presented, and so it's oftentimes they'll contact me and say, hey, Meek, um, do you know this person, and I'll either say yes or no, and so they're relying on me to basically verify the person that's coming to them about some source of help or services. Um, I will also say, um, I always said, make it plain and digestible and consistent. Research is great. However, speaking with community members that you desire to help, um, directly asking them of their needs and having a casual conversation and building up on that and establishing rapport has gotten us much further than a paper survey or handing them an iPad or just doing an interview style. Most of our folks that we serve of the community are elders or they are uh, youth between the ages of, you know, five and 17, 18. Um, so, you know, they, they don't want to do that. Um, and most of the time they are uh, kind of like bribed or incentivized, you know, hey, participate in our survey, you get this gift card we've never had to do that at all. Um, it's just by means of establishing a trusted way of communication and just real dialogue um, without trying hard to extract this information that you're needing for your data set and your numbers. Um, and so our community appreciates, you know, the, uh, the, the grassroots um, organizations and the people that have been doing the work to conduct this research and to start these initiatives because of the community trust that was already built. Um, and also don't, don't assume the resources that people need. Um, ask them. They'll tell you. Don't just assume. Um, they will literally tell you. Um, so yeah, that's all I have. Yeah, I'll, I'll add on to that and just say I love everything that you just said, because that's like a big thing that we try to do at Urban Tilt. And it's why um, <clears throat> our work becomes so easy, because we do hire so locally. And we do, I don't know, we just have a great, every, every new person always uh, contributes 
to the whole vision and um it's great to know like I'm always meeting people who because Richmond is a small city so I'm always meeting people who knows my cousin or a friend or something like that so and like I don't know if people know how this feels but it's like so rare that like especially BIPOC people have that poor BIPOC people have uh opportunity to talk to others like them and to feel empowered enough to have a voice in big decisions that are being made in our city because in the past hundreds of years <laughs> even like you could make the argument that like that we haven't had our voices heard and so um yeah it's just about like I don't know if that answers your question but uh because you know people I think it definitely is a powerful resource but um you know I don't think you need money to like talk to people um and so like yeah just trying to make sure that uh people who aren't normally at the table are feel like they're actually being heard because I think sometimes we um BIPOC people they do get invited to these decision making tables but they don't feel comfortable enough to speak up because it's a majority of people they don't grow up with and or like have the same manner of you know conversating or priorities or you know culture so I think that's definitely uh something that um I think people can can try to incorporate um I actually really loved this question because um I've actually been I've been doing a lot of personal and professional research on kind of this area and what it what food insecurity actually looks like at a large scale since it's pretty important for me to see um, as somebody who works in nutrition in the charitable food system and um, while I definitely think that it's important to you know empower and improve um, access to healthy foods within communities like how the community can come together excuse me and um, really promote that. I actually think this issue is more twofold than anything because um, I don't think that at a large scale, we need to rely on um, communities, individual communities to have to take care of um, each other in addressing food insecurity. While I, I recognize that community literally means like, you know, coming together, I think that um, putting the burden of food insecurity and access to healthy foods on the community is um, inequitable and very unfair. So I think that while, you know, as a as a food bank in the charitable food system, where we do reach out to so many different counties and are partnered with so many different types of organizations, um, and we have a very diverse population in the East Tennessee, uh, much more than then um, honestly, I knew before I, I joined Second Harvest, um, it's, it's really important to, to partner with those organizations, you know, meet the needs right there, empower them to, to serve their communities, um, but also, you know, look at policy at those levels and the, and the local policy and state policy and, you know, federal policy to make changes to the underlying causes of food insecurity um, and like equitable pay and housing and all these things that ultimately um, highly influence food insecurity and what we do. Um, and so I, I always say at the food bank that I think a lot of our my, my coworkers would agree that I would love to not have a, a job anymore at Second Harvest because at all these uh, the policy is set in place where community, communities are self-sustainable and they have all the resources they need to take care of each other, but that it's not because we as a system rely on those communities to take care of each other. They are resourced to do so. So that's, um, that's something that I'm kind of, as a personal and professional project, trying to really make sure as a charitable food, um, as part of the charitable food system to, to, uh, to help out with. Um, and, and we're talking about the resources to make sure as far as um, resources that we've seen and being able to support our organization, I would say um, what 
you all kind of have already mentioned, um, it comes down to relationships, I think, and whether it is helping the relationships with the families and the children that you're serving and the relationships with the partners and the um, folks in the community that you want to be supporting um, and working together and finding a common uh, common ground to figure out, you know, how can we all work together? I had the example this morning being at um, the school system and they had partnered with the food bank. And um, so they were doing their part and continuing to serve meals to the students, um, but also had found a partner who in the food bank being able to provide additional resources for the whole family um, once a month through their food box. Um, so I think um, understanding uh, what it is the need is and then being able to follow through and I think follow through is a huge piece um, to understanding and improving um, the lives of those in our community. So um, I, I think you all already summed it up very well, so I won't go any further. So I am actually going to jump to a question that came from one of the audience members. And, and it really refers to that oxymoron of empowering in the third pillar of the, of the third pillar of the White House um, Conference on um, Hunger, Nutrition, and Health. Um, because the, the, uh, the audience member says, what do the panelists think about empowering? Um, to me, if families don't have access to reliable funding, transportation, food, health care, um, what can we do? What can we do to empower them? And and the person mentions that obviously you didn't write the third pillar, um, but the, just wondering what your thoughts are about that word empowering. Um, you know, perhaps how would you rewrite it, or what does empower mean to you? Given that you are empowering community members, but it may not necessarily be in what others consider to be empowerment. I think it depends on who's using the term empowering and how you're using it. Um, oftentimes, I know us in the Rooted East Collective and those that volunteer with us or, you know, community members that are in our program, they know that one of our, you know, part of our mission is to restore power back that has been taken away. So not necessarily using the term empower, but I know personally using the phrase restoring power as far as giving the community members back their power by way of food systems and equitable actions that um, they feel empowered and I don't even have to say it. Like it's like this understanding, this mutual understanding that okay, um, these folks are mobilizing all of our resources. So yes, we may not, Yes, uh, collectively, they may not have the funding. However, we receive the funding to ensure that they get everything that they need. So we're not only mobilizing um, gardening education, but we're mobilizing nutrition and food education as digestible to them. We're mobilizing other uh, skill building um, assets like you know wound care, gun safety, like all the things to where they don't have to rely on outside forces or go outside of it because most of our community members travel by foot or ride share. It's very, very complicated when you're working in marginalized communities, specifically the black community, because everybody thinks that um, it's like this one size fits all um, uh, solution, but it's not. I think of it as like a dinner table with four legs. And it's very, it's very complex, but yet simple. So yes, we have food here, but we also have black equity and we also have transportation issues. And we also have social determinants of health. Like it's like this big ball of everything that contributes to um, our health and tons of other things within the community. So I don't really use the term empowering. I always say um, restoring, uh, recreating, building more um, positive things. And like I said, I do believe that it depends on who is using the term empowering. I think with um, some of the, I, I, first of all, I love this question as well. So thank you, um, Diane, for, for asking it. Um, in, in my research, research as well, um, some of the things as far as empowering goes, we, um, 
historically the charitable food system has had a reputation of kind of taking away some of that power um, because it was actually established as kind of a, a place where excess food was given so that way it didn't go to waste. And so people who were recipients of this system um, were already kind of set up as like not being treated at, at as, as well as they should have been and kind of with, um, with dignity. And so um, as, as the food system had, as the charitable food system has kind of progressed and um, we have kind of, we are kind of rebranding, I would say as a, as a whole um, on trying to provide a client choice model so that way people are able to choose their foods rather than um, like <laughs> I've been I've been told stories from my my boss who's worked at the second harvest longer than I have that we would try to give away on mobile distributions like 10 pound bags of popcorn kernels because that was what was donated to us and we weren't in a position to be able to purchase extra um, nutritious foods and things like that. And so I don't know, besides a movie theater, who's going to want a 10 pound bag of popcorn kernels, but um, now we're in a position to where we can purchase nutritious foods. We can um, get like make them available to our, um, our pantries, which actually we, um, our purchasing powers is good. So that way our pantries are able to purchase food from us at a discounted cost so they can use their funding elsewhere. In addition, we also have um, our produce is free of charge to our, our pantries. So we encourage a client choice model at these pantries so uh, people who are already kind of limited in what they are able to choose, um, we have lots of options so that way they can choose them. We, we try to offer more options. Um, now, we also try to you know, uh, encourage people to sign up for SAP and other government assistance programs so that way they can actually like even more so take that money and go to a grocery store and have even not unlimited, but almost unlimited uh, client choice options. So that's kind of how we try to um, empower populations, though I would argue um, or I, I agree that empowering is is a challenging word when people have limited resources um, because of a larger issue with um, it, with the overall system. Uh, I, I just wanted to share briefly, I agree with both of you. Um, we just did as an organization, um, we're, we're in the middle of kind of uh, rebranding, reorganizing as well, and, and really focusing on um, uh, equity and diversity and inclusion for all. Um, and uh, the word empowering, we had a, did an asset-based framing um, to be able to tell the story of those that um, are being supported um, and, and are live in their lived experience. Um, and, and the word empower did come up. And um, and we felt like if the word empowers there, that was the fact that someone had power over someone else and how do we remove that word? And so I really liked the way that you utilized um, restoring power or mobilizing or building that sounds much more positive. And I think um, ensuring that our team is um, better skilled at making sure that we on our side um, don't tell the wrong story or and, and don't assume anything from anyone else uh, about anyone else's life is something that we hope to be able to, to do better at. And I think we're all trying to do better. Um, and so, so that was something that, that kind of had, had came into mind as we were having the conversation. Yeah, <laughs> I'll keep my answer brief, but uh, my mind's going everywhere with this answer, but yeah, I agree that I don't think uh, people can be empowered if they don't have reliable funding, transportation, food, healthcare. Um, like health health outcomes is directly impacted by systemic, uh, you know, influences, and it's why we like to 
distribute straight to people's homes because if transportation's an issue, like um, we try to deliver where we can, we try to post up our four free farm stands at community events. Yesterday, we just had a farm stand at a soccer field where people gather and had a doctors, they did like a walk with the doctor around the track where people were able to um, talk to a doctor and they had Zumba class. So it's like a bunch of different things, you know, and um, I think it is like a matter because if if this is Biden, the idea of empowerment coming from the Biden administration, and that means that like if we pass X, Y, and Z programs, then now they can say that people are empowered and, you know, like we know that's usually not the case when the national government is telling people like, yeah, they're free or they're healthy. And, you know, it's like, well, we need to ask the people, like, do they feel empowered? And I think that goes back to what Mika was saying about uh, who is the person saying, are they empowered or not? And um, yeah. Thank you. So all of you truly spoke about the importance of collaborations between local organizations to really um, increase the reach and impact of local efforts. Could you provide um, a, an example of a community community collaboration that you did in your community that was successful? I'll go first. <laughs> so um, we believe in collaboration. First of all, we are collective, which means that we have um, initiated collaboration by collaborating with each other to form this collective. Um, everybody um, that is a volunteer or whether you are a workshop instructor um, is a, a collaborator. Um, and we also partner with um, grassroots organizations outside of East Knoxville, but also the black led grassroots organizations, um, along with nonprofits like United Way. United Way, um, our partners there were the first um, was the first organization to donate us unrestricted seed capital to allow us to uh, serve our community. Um, also, um, being in the Black community here in Knoxville, um, it can be sometimes hard when other Black organizations are addressing other issues of the community um, and based off like uh, conflicting time schedules. Um, it, you know, sometimes we have to, you know, allocate resources outside of our community just because the need, like we have tons of needs in our community. Um, so changing the status of collaboration over competition is very important to us because we have we notice that we all have a variety of skill sets that our community needs along with our network reach um, to better our community. Um, so yeah, I just feel like when everybody collaborates um, for the betterment and, and has integrity in their work, and that community trusts them, um, it just, it goes a really long way. Um, one of the collaborations that Second Harvest has, um, it's actually with Chris Battle with Battlefield Farms, who is part of uh, Rooted East with, uh, with Mika. Um, he has a, he kind of already had an established partnership with Nourish Knoxville, which is our, um, our kind of our farmer's market kind of uh, initiative in uh, the area. And so Second Harvest will, uh, we actually purchase food from uh, the farmers that it's, it's the left, not the leftover, but the stuff that the farmers have, I guess it is leftovers, <laughs> but they're not bad leftovers. It's the leftovers that are, are from the farmers at the end of the market. And we are able to uh, purchase those for um, for the veggie van, and Chris Battle will take the, those foods to um, his community in East Knoxville. Second Harvest also um, does supplement a little bit uh, with some produce uh, for for him as well. So that's kind of a collaboration um, among 
three organizations there with Nourish Knox, Second Harvest, and um, Battlefield Farms. Um, I'm just going to share one that just happened recently. Um, last week, I was uh, doing presentation at the Tennessee School Nutrition Association Conference in Gatlinburg and um, wanted to go by and visit one of our Boys and Girls Clubs that is in the Smoky Mountains. And as I was visiting with them and they were sharing, um, you know, understanding the food program, you can only offer two snacks or two meals uh, a day. And so some of the children at the Boys and Girls Club stay a very long time um, and only two meals a day is not really enough. Um, and so as I was going, leaving the visit, going to this uh, the conference, the Boys and Girls Club asked if there was any way that if there were any leftover food items that could be brought um, that they could collect. And in fact, we reached out to the, the folks who were putting on the conference and sure enough, um, we were able to send home, help send home two, two truckload full of food um, back to the Boys and Girls Club to be able to help support um, additional food that the families may need or extend the day while the kids are there. So that's just one example. But we've also been able to connect, um, you know, a Boys and Girls Club in Middle Tennessee with the food bank there who's now going to be bringing in suppers for the kids or the school system that um, didn't have a supper program. And now, like I said, the food bank is going to be sponsoring them. So um, just increasing access to those meals um, and making the right connections that maybe folks didn't realize were, were available um, and offering that as a resource. Yeah, <clears throat> I'll say that. And as I mentioned yesterday, we had an event that was um, we call it Thriving Thursdays, which will be every Thursday during the summer. And it'll have like different uh, organizations coming to give out resources. They had Rich City Rides, who's a bike shop, um, Zumba class, uh, lifelong doctors telling them about the importance of exercise. First five that gives out parenting resources. Um, and so the, the soup. The county supervisor office has been super helpful since the beginning. Like they're the reason why we were able to purchase the community farm that we have um, rather than sell it to a developer who's trying to profit off um, and like take our take take up all the land in North Richmond and you know just turn it into a commercial industrial kind of area where people live and you know right next to an elementary school. So um, I'll answer the question by saying, I think successful partnerships with other community orgs is uh, you determine that by how continuous it is and making sure that it's consistent because there's been plenty of times where, you know, organizations come together and they put something on and every, all the residents are wondering, like, when is this going to happen again? This was so great. It's like, sorry, like, you know, funding issue or uh, this issue, that issue, and um, this will be the last one pretty much. And so I really like to see that, like, I'm actually not just creating partnerships, but friendships with people who are very like-minded and have the same passion towards their work and um, healing uh, Richmond, who who has a lot of, like, hurt and um, trauma and, you know, all that stuff. So, um, yeah, I just want to focus on that idea that making sure that it's a continuous partnership and that we don't come up with like reasons to end it. Um, it's not a perfect process either, you know, there's like definitely some ugly moments that happen because this is a very personal thing for all of us. And, um, you know, just making sure that we we're prioritizing the work, but we're also prioritizing our own health too, you know, that kind of thing. So just being on the same page with other community orgs is a big uh, factor, I'd say. Pamika, you wanted to add? Yes, I wanted to uplift um, Courtney's uh, mentioning of one of our co-founders, Chris Battle. Um, it is, I wanted to kind of give like a backstory. So that was our first collaboration. That's why we formed Rudities. So myself being a food educator and a food pathways practitioner, Chris actually needed help 
um, with the Fannie Lou veggie van and the disbursement of, um, I guess, the routes in the community, but also he needed somebody that could go out with him with disbursement and educate community uh, members on the types of produce as far as the benefits and how to prepare them in the multitude of ways. And so we came together to form Rooted East and then we went and found other grassroots organizers and members of the community or that have already been in the community with us um, that intersected and aligned with our vision. So thank you, Courtney, for mentioning that. I have to give credit to my co-founder, Chris Battle, as well. Awesome. And I think the other thing that we need to think about, too, is changing the perception of leftover, because there were once a time with many of our ancestors who used all the food for for everyone and every piece was special and precious and it continued for for sustaining life. And so we need to take that negative connotation from leftover away and start seeing as hey, this is just something else that we can continue to use. Um, so one other question, how can maternal and child health professionals help improve the food system and increase economic development in historically marginalized communities? So what advice do you have for those in the audience to really help improve the food system and to impact the economic development? Oh, well, I'll go first. <laughs> Because um, so I'm the founder of the Lotus program, which initially started as a postpartum meal delivery uh, wellness program for moms post birth um, loss and grief. However, we have expanded full spectrum. Um, I'm not sure if um, those that are on this call know, but black women um, suffer from postpartum depression um, and distress four times more likely than any other demographic. And um, a lot of that um, comes down to socioeconomic factors, stress, um, and but also nutrition and by ways of food pathways. And so as a food, as a food educator, obviously research, but also placing um, the pressure on other practitioners, whether you're in the uh, holistic birth and maternal space, but also um, whether you're in the, you know, the, the industrialized medical complex or whatever you're in. Um, a lot of the times, um, you know, we have Black women, you know, are dying at alarming rates. Um, we just saw it with Tori Bowie, an Olympic gold medalist athlete, um, you know, literally, you know, it may be triggering to some, but I, I've experienced um, postpartum as well, but just not her doctor not catching, um, you know, any signs of eclampsia or preeclampsia. So, and I, I feel like, you know, yes, she was, um, she was healthy, but did her doctor teach her the warning signs? Did her doctor tell her what to look out for? Did her doctor educate her family? Did her doctor, you know, pair her with community um, birth workers, you know, to kind of help alleviate any type of stress or whatever she was having? So I feel like doing more outreach and placing the emphasis on doctors and medical professionals to know who is doing the grassroots works. Um, prior to the medical um, industry, as far, as far as the industrialized medical industry and institutions, it was a very holistic practice. And we had community builders and we had community nurse, granny midwives in the community operating for community. And it was a, it was a trust there. Um, and so, you know, when you're working, uh, working with historically marginalized communities, trust is a big factor. Um, but I feel like sending community peers that look like that demographic into the communities to educate them on these topics, but also, you know, placing the emphasis and the pressure on these doctors. Um, you know, hey, the granny midwives are here. Hey, the holistic uh, food pathways practitioners here. Yes, we have RDs. Yes, we have nutritionists. But at the same time, um, are they being racially cognizant? Are they educating themselves on the, the uh, Black maternal health disparities, infant mortalities, but also the, the Black uh, 
the black eating regimen and historical archetype. Um, because, you know, I, uh, Dr. Spence knows we've had this conversation twice before that, you know, the curriculum sometimes that nutritionists and registered dietitians go through, it's not cognizant or, um, Re relevant enough um, to have that conversation with somebody of melanin uh, descent when we talk about the African or Hispanic diaspora. Um, I can't come to my community member and talk to them about Swiss chard. They're not going to know what I'm talking about nine times out of 10. So I have to make it very digestible and educate them on the who, what, when, why, how it's going to benefit them. Um, so in reference to maternal health, it, this is a collaborative effort. I don't think it's a one size fits all, doulas can solve this issue. Um, I feel like it's collective. So birth workers, food practitioners, regenerative medicine folks um, all need to come together for the betterment of maternal health, specifically Black maternal health and wellness. I think it's really important um, for healthcare professionals to um, to like basically echoing what what Famika said, um, and then also like being able to um, refer people to services um, like WIC and places that we know in, in food pantries and things like that um, as a sort of band aid uh, for for this for the issues there that are food related. But then on a larger scale, as I kind of mentioned before, really um, being present and advocating for uh, better health care for these marginalized communities and for paid maternal and paternal um, leave and better wages and equitable housing, and like all the underlying issues of um, that, that we know feed into having um, negative health outcomes, addressing these um, social determinants of health. And I've actually experienced in my own, um, in my own profession that sometimes it's like, well, why would, why would dietetics need to be, you know, involved in equal pay? Well, because it's actually absolutely relevant. Like all of this stuff, um, I, I've, I've heard a lot of things of like being in your lane and stuff. And while I'm definitely not going to tackle over into somebody else's, um, their area of expertise, something about me being able to elevate those voices and being able to be like, yeah, we're gonna to refer to these things. And so like the healthcare professionals really relying on people who are professional or having these lived experiences to make change um, with the communities and at larger scales as well. I wanted to say the same thing about um, making sure that uh, health professionals are aware of the resources that are um, available to them, to their clients and their patients. Um, I uh, just started adjunct professoring at uh, UTC as a community nutrition uh, course and had different variety of students with different backgrounds, um, but the large majority of their course was going out into the community to volunteer and better understand what the resources are in their community so that when they are, no matter what background or, um, you know, career that they take on, that they're aware of the resources in their community that they may be serving, whether it be the food bank or the food pantry or the soup kitchen or uh, the, the after school meal program that's available to the kids or the backpack programs like, um, you know, I don't know, coming into an, if they're coming into a new community, a lot of those are the same, um, but you just have to figure out who those partners are and, and get to know them um, and build relationships with them. Um, so that, that was definitely one, but I, I will say as a dietitian and I had worked in community nutrition for quite some time, I never did grasp what the summer food service program was or how it worked or, and so for someone who should have known um, and should have been educated on that, I did not. And yet, um, if we're expecting our families who could benefit from this program to be able to take advantage of it, if we aren't able to explain it and have a good knowledge of it, then we're, you know, we're not doing them a good service or the community a good service by not being aware of what the resources are. So just my experience. Yeah, I think it's a complex issue and um, one of the small ways that we try to 
tackle that is uh, by just getting involved with the children and getting, I think that's a big thing is getting children involved with the cooking process because a lot of the times that I noticed um, kids usually have this uh, preconception of like what vegetables are and they already don't want it. They want the fruit and the candy. But in reality, it's the vegetables that they're being exposed to. And so I'd say, uh, you know, doctors should really get involved in like advocating for better school lunches because um, kids are really open minded and they love cooking and they love vegetables in reality and um, let them determine how they want to use it. And it kind of goes back to the idea of empowering. Um, but yeah, just bring them to the table. And um, I think it uh, definitely affects the rest of the family. Uh, and yeah, that's all I'll say. Mika, I, have, I see your hand up again. Yes, I'm gonna shut up after this, but I'm very passionate about, <laughs> about maternal health as well. Um, so just meeting with doctors who, you know, are, you know, working as far as OBGYNs in this space. Um, I've talked to them about addressing implicit bias as well, um, but also maybe formula uh, formulating um, community resource lists because we find oftentimes that birth workers are collaborating and coming up with resource lists, but it doesn't often make it to the start of where our clients are coming from. Um, and so also I've noticed that dealing with maternal health in, in moms and children is that sometimes there's a disconnect when it comes to education with WIC and SNAP. Um, a lot of moms that come to me, particularly those in marginalized communities don't know that they can use their SNAP and their WIC benefits at the farmer's market and that they have the double up program. That is a big, big, big question that I always get or just like you know oh my gosh I can and so I have to educate them you know free of course and send them to the farmer's market um, but then there's also the stress of how do I shop at the farmer's market and so you know I have to kind of reel them in there and educate them on that as well but holding our medical professional professionals accountable is really, really important to me, but also listening to women. When a woman tells you, you know, when she's pregnant or the time that she conceives that she's having an issue, you should believe her. 80% um, of maternal mortality um, can be prevented um, by number one, listening. Um, and I'll also say that um, when government in particularly um, are establishing these like birth equity boards and whatever maternal health boards is very important for not only RDs and nutritionists um, and doctors to be present, but also those of the grassroots organizations that are helping these mothers, children, and families as well. Thank you. So true. Listening is super important. Um, I want to make sure that we get some of the Q and A's that are uh, online. There's one for you, Marco. It says, "Do you have a success story or strategy you can share about working with BOS for land?" It sounds like you must have created great partnerships and motivation among your BOS. Nice work. Do you have some recommendations on working with BOS for land, Marco? Uh, you might be confusing me with someone else because. I don't work with BOS, BOS. What does BOS stand for? I'm not sure. It was an anonymous point. A post, someone put that in the Q&A. So, hmm. Okay. So, and the other two, we're, I'm going to group them together because we're running a little bit um, on, small on time. One is asking about colleges and universities and how they can better prepare to work with communities. And another one is asking about establishing relationships between state level folks with local level folks and um, how can they work together without the relationship feeling ex extractive. So kind of both the same, you know, how can people not in the local level come and work with community members? We just ask folks to pull up. 
Like we literally have a, a work day schedule and we really do a call to action um, for most of our needs. So we invite um, people that don't stay in East Oxville into the collective to help out. Um, but, you know, we do have um, a type of decorum that we have, you know, allies and abolitionists and other folks follow so that they know how to operate in black and marginalized spaces. Like that is a must for us because like, um, I think it's, is it Diane? Yeah, Diane mentioned, you know, the extraction. We also, you know, historically have issues with infiltration of black led organizations. Um, and so, you know, we do a lot of training when it comes to how to operate in black spaces as an ally or government and official um the, the only we only operate with you know collaborate with like one quote unquote government entity but they understand their lane and their role and they also just ask simply how can we help and we tell them without it being a transactional relationship or um an extractive relationship if that makes sense Um, with the question that um, asked about colleges and universities, um, I will say that um, one of the things that I experienced back when I was in college, which was quite some time ago, but something that I did encourage my students to go and do, um, it was a poverty simulation. Um, and I don't know if they're on every college campus or anything along those lines, but for the students of mine that did participate in that and, and me personally, um, that was um an eye-opening experience for many of them. And I don't know that that really answers any questions, but that was something that to, to be able to see the resources and um, if you're going to be working in a community, what are the resources that are available? What are some of the challenges? And, and um, so that was just something that came to mind really quickly with that question. And as mm -hmm. far as telling stories, we do um, try to lift up um, folks on the ground as far as our, our meal programs, whether it be school nutrition professionals, um, uh, we have a storytelling team at uh, No Kid Hungry nationally, and they like to let folks know what's happening on the ground as we see. Well, oh. go ahead, Courtney. Oh, no, it's fine. <laughs> okay, I, I just want to make sure that we give people a, an actual physical activity break before we move on to our next sessions. A big thank you to Marissa, Courtney, Mika, and Marco. We truly appreciate the important work that you're doing in your communities. And we all aspire to do more of the work that you're doing so that all people can have um, healthy, nutritious food choices um, at their tables. So thank you again, all of you.